Sup, you beautiful bastards. I hope you're having a good one. Welcome to a conversation with where today we're having a conversation with a person that probably knows me the most in the mm -hmm. world, even more so than myself, yeah. uh, and has awesome stuff going on uh, herself, Lindsay DeFranco. That's me. I do know you very well. You think more so? Than, yeah. A lot you of think the, you know me more than me? I think a lot of the conversations we have, us, my mom's here. I was talking to her mm -hmm. about this earlier, about how some of the things you say, I know why you're saying. What do you mean? What You're does like that mean? Projecting. Well, should we talk about this morning? Sure. Oh, wait, this morning? <laughs> oh, wow. Is that? I was going to okay. So I was going to say that the way that I wanted to start off a conversation with, obviously, yeah. we're going to be talking about or talking to people I'm less familiar with, catching up, but I thought it'd be fun to open up with the person that knows me the most. <laughs> and apparently, we're going to talk about our, our almost fight this was morning. Was it a fight? Yeah. No. No. Do you want to talk about it? I mean, you brought it up, so apparently it's a sore spot. So now we're really building it up, and it was really not that big. <laughs> That's deal. most of our fights. But here's the thing we filmed a podcast before, what was it, like six months ago? <laughs> It was before I had wavy hair, so I think it was six months ago. I like that's, that's how, I, how I do my time. Before wavy and after wavy. It, it was before wavy, but after bangs. Okay. Yes, definitely after bangs. <laughs> but, but this morning. But this morning. So we were talking about last time. <laughs> so we filmed a, a podcast before, and I never really knew why Phil didn't post it. Well, I didn't post it because half the stuff we talked about wasn't relevant two weeks later. But apparently this morning it was because I didn't hold a conversation <laughs> well, which yes. I thought I thought the podcast went really well. No, it flowed really, really well. Really? So what was the problem this morning? Well, the problem was, like, I think part of it involved uh, a spat between PewDiePie, so Felix, and, and Lily, Singh. Lily Singh. Yeah. And I was like, I think this is, <laughs> I think part of it was like, I think this is... The media just blowing the situation out of proportion. And then Felix spent the next two weeks just like making fun of her. <laughs> I was like, never mind, never mind. I just seem like a big idiot. Right. So I was the problem, like most things in our relationship. So it you're projecting this morning. <laughs> Are we admitting this or no? <laughs> I thought it was just like helpful husband advice. But uh, actually, I feel like this leads into. So I had. I had oh, change the subject. I had, okay. I had questions that I wanted to, to bring up. And then I thought another fun way to do it uh, before getting to, to some of those would be to open it up to my audience. So I asked people on, yeah. on Instagram uh, questions about me, since you are a, <laughs> an expert and shit talker when it yeah. comes to Philip DeFranco. Uh, what is the best and worst thing about Phil is the first question we're going to open up with. Hmm. Let's open up with best so that I can fill the ego before you chop it down. Well, one of the things that really threw me off about our conversation this morning <laughs> was that. No, no, no. This is good. This is the best thing about you. OK. Is that you are not <laughs> going to sound like awful. you're not mean to me like you're not. You're very it supportive. It does sound like you have a very low bar. You're not mean. Like, you're very supportive. Mm. So when anything kind of, when you come at me with anything that's not that, I take it harder than it's probably meant to be. So it sounds like I need to be less supportive. Probably. So that more. when you really have something bad to say, that I'm just like, this is just Phil. He's just mean. Like that? But I feel like I, I offer criticisms. But not, like, you never make me feel bad. And no. so this morning I felt bad about my performance or whatever it was <laughs> last time. So that's so that's a good thing about you, though. And then I and then I was thinking about it later and like talking to Rebecca about it and talking to my mom about it. And I was like, what what I love really that this is a thing? Yeah, no. Yeah. But I think that's why it really threw me off, because that's not how you are towards me. Sure. You are very you're like you're an amazing husband. So when any what's what's the thing it's like i don't it's something you said about doing the dishes you're like i don't want to do them every day because when i don't do them it doesn't have the same impact well i've joked about the reason that i'm i'm stellar in so many places as i i set the expectation super low yeah uh so when i do something it's like like I, you're need, very, I need, I need that's to. That's not true. Maybe in to, other areas of your life, you're that way, but not with me. No, well, it, for me, that's a little bit joking because I, I feel like online, and th I think this is a case for a lot of dads. We get to be like superheroes for just showing up. Yeah, and that's like I want to have that, but in every facet of my life. And so with the dishes, I think that's one of them. It's like, oh, but okay, trying. you guys, I don't do the dishes, no. Phil. Does the dishes. But I like it. Like I like Phil, anytime I can do something. Like I'm not a man's man, so anytime I get to do something with my true. hands, yeah, no, I'm not. Like I uh <laughs> I need call to call the handyman to get this door fixed. I'm like, you could probably Google it. I don't care. Oh, so then the worst thing. Yeah. I guess something recently has Ooh. been I've been really excited about like specific things in my life and I'm wanting to like talk to you about them, but then 
you have a lot of crap going on as well. So sure. I'm like trying to talk to you, but you're like texting someone here because it's like an important thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's just bad timing where I'm trying to tell you about something that's like on the top of my brain right now. And you're like still on your phone. And it's not like you're fucking around like on yeah. Instagram, like you have stuff that you're you, important stuff that you're doing, but it makes me feel like yeah. not important. I get that. No, you know? well, because people constantly ask me like, how how do you how do you manage your time? And I'm like, I don't. You don't. Like, there, there's always you someone, try. But I try. Yeah, but there's always something or someone that is either feeling like I'm not giving yeah. them the like the attention that they probably deserve or like the respect that's associated with that. Mm -hmm. And that's always that's always an issue. I think that was what was so nice of when uh, I quit social media for a little bit is I could be focused. And I think yeah. part of it was seeing who I was without this, mm -hmm. right, for a little bit. I mean, kind of, um, because obviously who I am outside of here is enabled by all of this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, I, I'm horrible at time management, and it results in, like, if there's anyone, though, that outside of work that gets attention, it's you, and then I'm just a really shitty friend. <laughs> that's the main thing. You're a good friend to, like, one person. <laughs> one person, and that's, like, half the time. Yeah. I, it's it's something that I need to, to get better at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I found is that I have to have friends that are in the same stage of life as me because otherwise they feel like I am not present with them. Like if mm. I have a friend that isn't married or doesn't have kids, I don't think they really understand sometimes where my priorities are. Sure. With Do you like know the what I'm saying? You, so yeah. like most of my friends are married and have kids. Most of them are at least married. Some of them have kids, but we all are under this understanding, like if you text me once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, it's fine. It doesn't mean that our friendship is falling apart. It just means we're busy. We're just in, under that understanding because we all have stuff going on. Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit of a two way street. So it's one more of a, an understanding regarding why it's sometimes harder to get back to people, but then also <laughs> what makes me kind of furious. And I, I feel like maybe you hit this as well of if someone's late. Right. Like I already had an <laughs> issue with people being late, but because yeah. my time outside of like family responsibilities, work responsibilities is so limited. Mm -hmm. I was like, do you just not care? Yeah. Do you know, I mean, and which is a it's it's a little bit of an asshole thing in L.A. because there there are a lot of times where there can be an excuse of like, I really wasn't expecting that it was going to take double mm -hmm. uh, the amount of time to get there. But yeah, that's that's a big thing. Two but, of my best. Sorry. No, go for two it. Two of my best friends are constantly late. I still love them, oh, but I right. have to tell them, like, if we're leaving for dinner at six, I'll tell them we're leaving for dinner at 530 I'll, and they'll get there at six. And I love them so much that I don't care. I mean, I do care, but like. No, Lindsay will be like, so I told them it's this. They're going to get here uh, at uh, and it's usually like 45 minutes later. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a dick thing. And it's 100 percent right. Completely right. accurate. All right. So you kind of criticize me, but in a nice way. Uh, next question was, does it ever get hard seeing people criticize your spouse? If so, how do you deal with it? I get really mad. I was just You thinking, get angrier than me. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about this the other day, but I also think if somebody is rude about me or to me, you act react the same way. Like we are both mm. very protective of each other. Like I had, it wasn't like a spat with a friend recently. It was just kind of like a friend said something that kind of hurt my feelings. Sure. And Phil was like, fuck this person. Like you don't need her. And I was like, but she's like, I really like her. And yeah. You know what? I didn't realize. Cause I always kind of but, gave you crap about how you were protective mm -hmm. when people and, were horrible to me. And then I really haven't had a reason to feel like that. Yeah. And it, it made me kind of realize that if it's like some stranger, I'm always of the mindset of fuck those people. Like I know there's like a okay, group of people yeah. online. So it's that, different between strangers and people that are actually in our lives. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I think in general, like when you're, when you're thinking of measured resp responses or reactions, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's one of the reasons why, like, there's the only reason I don't talk about stuff more is what, because when it comes to people online, a lot of it is like a tension economy, yeah. right? So it's like, you don't want to say where specifically you're addressing, like, fuck you, you stupid, petty nothings, mm -hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, because you don't want them to be like, oh, like they get that value, yeah. which is, I mean, it's pathetic that people get that value of knowing that they had an impact mm -hmm. when it's just them wasting their lives being the worst versions of themselves. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah. That's well, a I think what really gets to me about people criticizing you is like 99% of it is not true. And it's just them trying to fit you into a narrative that they have of, the, of your life. And I think that's not just you. That's pe how people see anyone that they see online. They try to fit this they would try to fit your situation into a narrative that they have for your life. So it's sure. like 
whenever I see people criticizing, I'm like, that's not true. Why are you thinking that? And it's at the end of the day, I have to remind myself most of the time to not say anything. But on Twitter, if you like if somebody says something mean to you and then you respond to it, then I feel like I got to jump into and be like, yeah, (laughs) you have to be my partner. Yeah. I'm like, I'm with you 100 percent. Fuck you. Because you can't say fuck you. (laughs) Well, yeah. you do sometimes, but, sometimes but I come rare. in with the, the harder punch, I feel like. And then I regret it a little bit afterwards, a little bit. I, I feel like because that's it, not it's not professional. I you know, like, I feel like part of the reason I don't go super hard. It's a little bit because I, I don't want to stoop that low. And then two, I'm all, I'm always a little bit worried that I'm going to get suspended. <laughs> if I like oh, really yeah. go in. So I'm like, OK, I have to go just just like really top level or kind of witty and no. <laughs> deeply mean things. This is something we talked about last time I was on where it's people who are criticizing you, I think feel like they're shouting at you in a vacuum that you're not going to see. And so when you respond to someone, you also get responses to that response of people being like, why would you call, why would you put them on blast? Like you have an audience. And I'm like, dude, if you are going to say something so hurtful and so rude to anyone, you need to expect that they're going to come back at you. Sure. You're not yelling into like the void. You are saying something to someone. And that's something that I have had to kind of rein myself in on a lot too. So yeah, I think whether it be you or anyone that throws something at me or whoever. And I know that there are creators out there that don't agree with me. Uh, yeah. Hank Green, I know you don't agree with me. I love you. I, uh, I sent you a message <clears throat> the other day, Hank Green. Why didn't you respond to me? <laughs> Hank, make a second book. Yeah. Um, but oh, I know that. Well, that's not what my message <laughs> <laughs> um, But I know that he has an issue. But yeah, if you say something on Twitter, especially if it's an at, um, you should feel like you're saying it in a crowded room and yeah. that, that that person's in because that's mm-hmm. essentially what it, or that's, yeah, essentially what it is. Uh, and so if you're not, if you're not prepared for someone to all of a sudden speak back, then maybe don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe there, that's it. There was this guy who was being rude to me, to me on Twitter and like he was being so awful. So I searched his name and I found, and I found his Facebook and then I found that he was friends with my cousin um, oh, and so weird. I messaged her. I was like, who is this guy? Like, what's going on? And she said, the only reason I'm friends with him on Facebook is because he was really creepy and he came to my sorority oh. and asked all of us to follow him on Facebook. And if we did that, we'd get free meals at his restaurant. Ah. <laughs> so I was like, OK, this makes sense. Like, he's a douchebag and a creep. That he's like going around to sororities weird. at um, UGA and like. Yeah. But apparently it works. <laughs> but <it> works. <laughs> and like, I guess she got free like, food. So uh, he, he seems like a dude I'd see outside my window. But, but he gives me good food. I love tapas. Yeah. Um, OK, so not all criticism is hate. Right. Yeah. Uh, so something else to throw at you. Uh, have you ever strongly disagreed with something that I have said or done on the Philip DeFranco show? Hmm. Have I? Probably. I know that there's one thing and. I I agree and I disagree. I know that your thing, uh, and I just, I don't want to do it with each story. I think, I think that if I covered maybe one story a video, I feel more comfortable because it can get repetitive. Uh, I know that there are a lot of times that you think that I need to share my opinion on yes. stuff that mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, and I don't in a lot of cases because I feel like I don't know what else I could add to the conversations. Hmm. Right. Because it's like, there's certain stories where I think it's like, if I'm talking about, uh, Iran, or I'm talking about India. I just want to get the information out there, right? Uh, and and it's also the big thing of like a lot of people don't understand how much time it takes to regularly film a 15 to 20 minute show in the span of like five hours mm-hmm. of like from starting to film to when it's out. Um, but but no, I mean it is something that I've been trying to get more comfortable with because I, I feel like I create the proper separation, but. Yeah. I don't know. Well, see, I think what's important is that you have a voice and you have such an amazing opportunity to kind of show how you're feeling about things. And I think as long as it is presented in a way that it's like, this is my opinion. Sure. Not not in a factual sentence. So it's like, here's how I feel about it. So many people in this landscape are nervous to be polarizing, but I think it's sure. gotten to a point where you have to say something. I think it, but that's the thing is I think a lot of people think that I'm like, I'm scared and it's not, it's not from being scared. I think a lot of it stems from me just feeling 
frustrated and exhausted because I feel like, you know, in the past I've talked about feeling like the the most polarizing of people are the outliers and they're slowly trying to, to chew their way into the, to the common sense center. And I don't, <laughs> when I look out there into the world anymore, I don't know if the common sense center exists anymore. And I feel like nothing I say changes anything, that it doesn't move a dial. So why not just try and present the information and, and let people fill in their opinion? Not always. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like it's this balancing act that I haven't gotten perfect, that I'm still figuring out of what I'm comfortable with, what I think is helpful to the conversation. But yeah, it's, 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 it's a frustration of mine as well, just because I don't know if it helps anymore mm -hmm. um, or if it's just people just going like yep I agree with that um, or people fuck you you think that because you're insert blank right because right. people always just put They're someone in a box put, yeah so that they can go like they put you in a box so that you can they can they can dismiss what you're saying mm -hmm. even if it's true or not yeah so I think that I think that's where a lot of it stems from it's just a genuine frustration so I I think I get frustrated when I see people reporting on a story and they don't call a lie a lie so if someone is trying to promote this false narrative, someone, we all know who I'm talking about. If you're trying to promote a false narrative, you don't see, and, and it's changing, it is it is changing, sure. but for the longest time, you did not see the the press, the media journalists calling a lie a lie. Sure, they would you say like someone- You have to say it's a lie. Yeah, someone says this or, and then you saw like, I think, so it's like insert blank person, says this yeah or or and then there was like the evolution like, was insert like person lied and said blank like you have to say what's not true you can't just be like well they said this and i don't know it's not true i don't know yeah you, you can we've been conditioned to think that finding the truth is hard it's not if you know how to find the truth and you know how to search properly and think critically you can find the truth and so if you're not calling out lies for what they are and you're conditioned to think well i don't know is there a truth is there an objective truth sure. there is there always is yeah i'm frustrated which is uh, okay so that kind of works perfectly into a transition because i was going to go into this whole thing about <laughs> wait keep going keep going i need more time <laughs> no okay well i was going to say like the evolution of that right it was at first like person says this or per person denies this and then like the the slow evolution of that in headlines because unfortunately a lot of people just read the headlines mm -hmm. or like the f few snippets um it was like person says this with no evidence right right cites no evidence which i think is like the evolution but do they even say that now i think they well, more pl some places yeah more places do um but i think but I, not in headlines do they yeah, in some, in some. Hmm. But the problem is uh, a lot of the time it's places that get, well, all places at some point have been labeled fake news by a number of people. So should we talk about what fake news is? <laughs> because in my opinion, it's lies with an intent to deceive. Well, I mean, yeah. Okay, so you think that it, the intent fake matters? Fake news, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, for my definition of fake news, there is an intent to deceive. It's not making a mistake. Right. People make mistakes, especially with how fast news spreads now yeah. and how entitled, and not in a bad way, but how conditioned people have become to get news like right as something happens. Sure. So it's like if, if they're not reporting on it on the on TV and in the mainstream news, people are gonna find that information somewhere else, whether it's real or not. Yeah, I mean, you even saying that, it makes me... It makes me frustrated because I know that in the past, if someone made a mistake, I would just go for the throat. Yeah. And I think the longer that I did this, especially day in, day out, the more I realized, you know, oh, especially as you grow a team, as you as you're covering more and more, mm -hmm. the, the chances for you to to mess up on accident increase. Uh, but a huge chunk of people don't fucking care. Yeah. Uh, they don't care about the the intent aspect. They equate mm -hmm. you to the worst thing. Right. So, it's so like, intent really matters. Yeah. And it's it, I think it's important to call that out. And again, going back to a lie, a lie is an intent to deceive. It's not a mistake. So how do you compete, though, with right now, I feel like in our society, apologizing or acknowledging the mistake is yeah. almost more damaging. Right. I know. And that's like a problem with the, the culture that we see. It's like you can't demonize good journalists who are admitting their mistakes mm. because like this is what we've seen with a lot of people. It's like, why would you admit you've done something wrong when you're fucked either way? Yeah, and you know that, especially thanks to tribalism, people will just take a side. Yeah, yeah. like no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of double standards 
for a lot of people. But I think it's about educating people and and showing them like, this is how fast news goes. Mm -hmm. This is how we've been conditioned to want to uh, get the information quickly. So you're going to have to give these journalists some leeway. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have to say, you're going to have to go into it with an awareness of, okay, wait, they're saying the shooter was this person, but we need to wait a second before we like Google him or her, I guess. (laughs) And, And just hold on a second. Pause. Just pause. I just, I just realized that you kind of threw in your name a little bit. I did? Yeah, a little bit. Not your name, but the name of your... No, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Not so fast. Yeah. So a question was, new mom here. Yeah. How do you deal with anxiety of being a new oh, mom? Oh my God, it's so hard. <laughs> you, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. No, that's what... That, that's the Make reason. sure you have a good support system. That's all yeah. I can say. And I feel like I feel very fortunate to have had a good support system. And mm-hmm. I don't know what I would have gone crazy otherwise. Yeah. Like you understand and my mom and like people around, they understand how I am. Sure. And how anxious I get and how my anxiety is real. And something I was thinking about today is I don't like how people throw around these words like, oh, you know, my water bottles have to be lined up. I'm so OCD. And I'm like... <laughs> people really struggle with OCD, like it affects their lives. And so when I hear people talking about anxiety, like flippantly, like, oh, I'm just, I have mm. so much anxiety. I'm like, are you just nervous? Or do you really have this debilitating thing that affects your everyday life? You well, know what I mean? Like you yeah, can't just flippantly attribute some like mental illness to your being neurotic a little bit. Sure. Well, I think you probably feel more passionate about it because it's stuff that you've just like, you've genuinely suffered with for a long time. The reason I think it's a minefield is it's impossible to be in someone's head. Yeah. So (laughs) even with you, I feel like legitimately talking about, because I know a good chunk of, of people that are like that, of where it's just when it's convenient it's like that stuff sort of is yeah. mentioned. Uh, but it's, it's a rough thing to talk about because it's, it's such a like important issue of our time that I think is becoming even more of an issue based yeah. off of social media. And it's really like developing these mental illnesses and people that I don't think would have them otherwise. Yeah, I so think it's like a lot this of weird the time balancing it's, it's like feeding a mental and you know, I, I grew up thinking, and up until maybe like two years ago, thinking the word mental illness was so taboo. And I was like, well, Mm. I have major anxiety and depression, but I'm not mentally ill. But that's what it is. But Mm -hmm. mentally ill to me was like, you're in a psychiatric hospital. Sure. But that's not what it is. But also, like, I'm not trying to write off anybody's struggles. I'm just saying, like, there's varying degrees of it. And I feel like, like having postpartum anxiety is a lot different than having, um, you know, you're a little nervous. Mm Mm-hmm. But I think that, and and I don't but think the, it's... you think the overuse of the word minimizes is d- the real... The problem. Yeah. And I don't think that people who use it have bad intentions at all. Sure. But I think it kind of takes away from... There's anxiety and then there's anxiety disorder. Mm. And so, I don't know. I didn't... I and, and I guess I can kind of come at it from this angle of, I thought I was anxious and I thought I had depression. Sure. And I did have depression more so, but I thought I had anxiety, but I never realized how bad it could be until after I had Carter. Like that's when it really became debilitating for me. Sure. And I don't know. I just, I feel like I had to have a good support system, which I did, but even that doesn't cure it. So, you know, well, that's what I was going to say. Is it, is it that it's changed? Is it something you got? I think it was a hormonal yes. thing. Okay. After so, him. So after, so after Carter, it felt a completely different level than what you experienced. Yeah. Before, of that. like mm. before I think it was like depression. Sure. Um, but then after that, I think it turned more into anxiety, um, like debilitating, can't focus, can't do anything. Um, just want to go to sleep cause I can't deal. Mm-hmm. And I feel very fortunate that you, listen to me and you don't try to like write it off yeah. as some people like just choose to be happy. <laughs> okay. Like just try sure. to be happy. I'm like, do you, do you think I'm choosing to be this way? Like I'm sure. not, you've seen me break down. I don't have breakdowns a lot, but when I do, I'm just like, I don't, one day I was telling you, oh, when was it? I don't remember when it was probably like six or nine months ago. And I was like, I just want to hit my head on the wall because I feel so broken mm. and I don't have any advice. I don't know, like <laughs> seek help, but also like, don't be ashamed of it because when you're ashamed of it and you're questioning, like I have such a great life, why do I feel this way? It makes it worse. Yeah. Like just acknowledge it and be like, how, what can I do to make it better? Don't try to write it off. Like re- in my, what works for me is really let yourself feel it. Yeah. And don't 
like, and I've gone through several times of being like feeling guilty about it. Mm -hmm. Like I have a great life. I have a great family. I'm supported all that stuff, but I still feel these ways. And, and and then thinking about why do I feel this way? Like feeling bad for myself or feeling something's wrong with me. It's not helpful. Yeah. It wastes energy. And it's just like (laughs) deal with it. Like, like let yourself feel. It's kind of like when you go to Pixar movies, when you want to cry, you watch a Pixar movie because you want to feel it. Yeah. Like let yourself feel it. Stop pushing it off. Yeah. But also, yeah. But also like find someone to confide in. Yeah. Yeah. Seek help. I always, and I, I'm hesitant to say go on medication because it's like, it's different for each person. Sure. But I think that's the thing is like speaking with a professional, I think it's great to have a friend system, but I think Mm -hmm. there's nothing that can replace like a real, uh, solid professional. Also because you have to remember that, you know, your friends, like they may be suffering from something as well. And I mm-hmm. think that there's a real conversation about, you know, how we affect one another and we'll mm-hmm. try to be there for each other. But maybe it, it also adds to the stress of like potentially feeling like you're going to pull someone down, even if that's not the case. So it's a, uh, I think educating friends too. And I don't know exactly how to say it, but letting people know, like I have this really good friend Bailey and she, does not know what anxiety is like. She does not know what depression is like. She will always listen to me and say like, those feelings are completely valid. How can I help? As opposed to being like, well, you should just be happy. Like you have blah, 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 blah. Like she really listens to me even though she doesn't understand. And I think as a friend, and if you have a friend that's trying to confide in you, like a lot of, at least for me, a lot of the time, I don't need a fix. I just need someone to listen and like, I'll come to you sometimes. I'll say, can you just hug me? Yeah. Like just squeeze me so that I like feel safe. And like, it almost gives me like a release. At, like mm-hmm. when you're squeezing me and then you let go, I'm like, okay, I'm fine. Like something's been squished. So I think just as a friend, being someone who will listen and not make you feel bad about it, it's good. I love that. But the question that I was gonna lead into and then you were right that it just really had no way to transition. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I thought was coming. While we're on motherhood, I know you were all amped up. Um, how did you, so how do you, how did you handle your pregnancy with Carter after your miscarriage? I'm terrified. And it was those last two words that made me feel like it was something that I wanted to throw on this because like, that's like, it's a, I don't know. uh, We, we covered a video where we talked about, uh, uh, maternal mortality. And we, yeah. we, you know, we heard from all these women that had similar experiences. We heard after the fact of a husband saying like he was able to save his, his wife because he was there, he was listening, he was a partner. Uh, and so I thought you can speak to this. Um, obviously I gave you a heads up cause I, yeah, you're like, can we talk about, yes, I wouldn't it's fine, spring this Cause I think you. it's important. Uh, so what was the question? It was, <laughs> how did you handle your pregnancy with Carter after your miscarriage? But obviously you can speak about anything. So here, I think this might be where my anxiety disorder came from mm. was the miscarriage. Like I had anxiety before, but I think it turned into a, a problem after the miscarriage because my whole time being pregnant with Carter, I thought I'm going to lose him. I'm going to lose him. I'm mm-hmm. going to lose him. Um, because I guess I had a miscarriage at, was it eight weeks? Right. 10 weeks. I don't remember, but it was really hard. And you know, what's so, <laughs> so, so fucked up is I had the miscarriage. And then that night we watched the first episode of this is us where they lose a damn baby. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. And I think my mom was there and she even said like, I don't know if you want to watch this, but I did anyways. And I remember laying on the floor and this was the day, like um, me, my mom and Trey were at Universal Studios and I was like, I was bleeding a little bit and I thought, you know, it's probably normal. It's just spotting. Like this happens in pregnancy, whatever. And then I called my doctor and she was just, I forget even what she said, but she didn't seem concerned. She's Mm -hmm. like, just wait. And we hadn't even heard a heartbeat at that point. I don't think. Yeah, we were waiting to go to our eight week appointment. Anyways, um, and then something just didn't feel right. And I, so we got home from Universal and I made you take me to the ER and they were like, we don't see a baby in here. Mm -hmm. And then we came home and it was really hard. I was devastated and I didn't think that losing a baby that early would have affected me as much. Cause I know a lot of people who have lost them way later in their pregnancies, like people I'm very close to and they didn't really talk about how it made them feel. Um, but it's devastating. And, um, I don't know. So throughout my pregnancy with Carter, at a certain point in your pregnancy, you count kicks and all this stuff. I was very on top of counting kicks. But also at at 10 weeks with Carter, I was at the gym and I went to the bathroom when I was done working out and I was bleeding like heavily. Do you remember Mm -hmm. this day? And I called you. I was like, meet me 
yeah. at the doctor's office. I'm bleeding. And she like fit me in and we were sitting in her office and I was just bawling, like just so like inconsolable, like I'm losing this baby again. And she checked us out and everything was fine. But um, the whole pregnancy, I was very anxious and it got to the point where I had to be induced because I was so scared of losing Carter. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my doctor about it and she said, this anxiety is not good for you. It's not good for the baby. Let's just, and I know a lot of people are like, a lot of people are against induction and um, right. think that it's doctors just trying to pump ladies through the system, which I do think happens. Um, but in this case, I don't think that's what happened. I think she could tell because also because it was my second baby. She was she kind of knew that I wasn't right. Like in the headspace, as you mean? Yeah. yeah. Like she knew that it would be better for me to deliver at 39 weeks sure. than to go another week and like just being be worried. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a time during that pregnancy that, so my doctor told me like, if you feel anything is off, like go to the ER and they'll admit you and they'll do tests. Sure. And I had to really, I'm not good at abdicating for myself in, uh, in medical situations. And I, they didn't want to admit me. So I had to say, I haven't felt kicks in 24 hours oh, or wow. so, just so they would admit me. Cause they were like, well, you could just go to your doctor or whatever. It's fine. And I was dehydrated. I hadn't felt kicks in like three hours, but apparently that's not good enough for them to admit you. But like people lose their babies over that. So just admit, like I have insurance, just admit me, you know? Um, but again, my friend, she had diabetes or she has diabetes mm -hmm. and those are high risk pregnancies. And I feel like at third, she was having to go through, uh, like every week she had to be monitored and go to the, her doctor and get everything checked out just to make sure that she wasn't having, um, that she wasn't losing the baby. And she, uh, she went in one day for her, uh, just her tests. And they were like, we have to rush you in right now. Mm -hmm. Your baby has no heartbeat. And so they tried to put her into labor and it, like she wasn't going to labor and then they had to do a C-section and, and the baby came out like blue and he ended up being fine. Mm -hmm. But had she not gone to the doctor when she was supposed to, she would have lost her baby. And so I just, please advocate for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't care how stupid you feel, especially if it's like your life and your baby's life. Yeah. If you're like, please advocate for yourself. Yeah, if you lie, are if you have to just to get seriously, like if, I don't know. I just, I could not get over the fact that they did not admit me. Well, I think with pregnancies, it's important, but I think just people in general, like especially if anyone goes in for a surgery, having someone there that can advocate for you, advocate for yeah. you. Um, it's, it's like you can be timid. Just it's, it's a life or death situation. Yeah. So you have to be in a different. Well, I feel like when you went to the hospital recently, I felt like I was advocating for you some. Well, you were, <laughs> You were helpful because uh, I notoriously have a horrible memory. And so like I, w I was going through all like just. He just. had this abdominal pain, like really bad abdominal pain after we had been out of the country and his abdomen was swollen. Yeah, and it was hard. bad. It and was so bad. we called our friend Jess to come watch the kids because it was like 10 p.m. And then we went to the hospital. First of all, they said on his hospital bracelet, they said he was born in like 2009 or something. And so I feel like, <laughs> or was it 1999? 1999. Yeah. And so they were like, wow, you look, and I was like, no, you got to fix this. Like, because if you don't fix it, you're going to look at his symptoms and be like, oh, and look at how much older he looks mm. and think like, he's dying. Something's right wrong. Now. Yeah. Right now. So do you have a disease? Yeah. Well, yes, I do. Well, and then, <laughs> and then I think we're a part where I advocated for you where I was like, no, he's been out of the country. Like, I don't think you yeah. remembered that we were in Turks and Caicos. We all got sick after being in Turks and Caicos. Yeah, I was just, I was just freaked out because one, I was in just a pain that, I mean, you know me, I, I was, there's no reason I want to go to a doctor. Yeah. I will, I will. You've been I conditioned will, to think I've, that they're bad. I mean, the last time we went to the hospital together for me was probably when you had a kidney stone nine years ago. I had a kidney stone. I dealt with a kidney stone pain for three days yeah. before I went to the, the the hospital. And he was not insured, <laughs> and we did not have any money at that time. Oh yeah, that was. That and was we a got bad the fifty two hundred dollar bill just for him to be there and for the doctor to give him some painkillers. Well, and I we think were they like, did. They did an X ray. <sighs> oh, they, they did. Well, yeah, because they they were like, uh, we have to confirm that there's a kidney stone. I was like, man, it's the only thing it could be. Please God, like uh, and like you were praying for kidney stone. Basically. Yeah, and he was yeah. like, we have to, we have to check, and it was so. Thank God. 
And then I was just drugged up for about a week and I passed it at some point. Don't remember it. Really? Yeah. Do you remember? Because they had me. I think you did pass it. Was, it. it was the moment or it was like a, they gave me like Percocet. Yeah. And, I was, and, and you were like, oh, this feels too good. No, it felt way too good. I yeah. was like, oh, that's how you could get addicted. So that's how I felt after um, after having kids and they gave me painkillers. And I was like, this feels way too good. Like, I did understand. You dump, did you jump yours? Yeah, the ones that I, I had left. Too, yeah, yeah, because I knew, oh, this is dope. Like, this feels so good. You're not like, oh, I'm feeling a little in the back. I'm just, a li- I don't feel so happy yeah. today. Let's take a painkiller. Like, I get it. I absolutely understand people get hooked on those. Yeah. Which, uh, since we're already talking about family, I'll give you more time before news. Uh, you used <laughs> you to can have, go into you news. Used to I have, just don't you, want it to go from miscarriage to what have you been uh, working on <laughs> since your miscarriage? Oh, my God. Uh, so, you used to have uh, a family vlog channel. Yeah. Right? The Franco yeah. Fam. You quit it. Why? Why? See, I had a really good answer to this six months ago. Has it changed? Or you just I forgot? I just don't remember. <laughs> I was like, because I can answer everything for you. I was just ready to stop, right? I mean, I just, yeah. there was a lot of pressure. Anxiety played into it as well. I was sure. really trying to keep up. And what did I say before? Well, I I'm just like, like so, I'm so far removed from that life now. It was just a lot of pressure and a lot of judgment. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's sometimes... You have to have, obviously, like in general, everyone will be like, have a tough skin. But no matter what, at a certain point, shit just starts breaking through. Yeah. Right. And it feels like for some creators, and I imagine it's not like unique, I think a lot of it boils down to you're releasing a video and you're preparing to get punched in the face. Yeah, right? exactly. Or judged for like, And I would search through comments being like, who's going to fucking say something about how terrible of a mom I am today? Mm-hmm. And I think what really made me stop is we we raised a great kid with Trey and then I was trying to do those same things with Carter. And then, but when, when I was, okay. So when we started the family vlog, Trey was a year old. Yeah. So I didn't talk about the sleep training or anything because by that point we had already done that. Well with Carter, I started vlogging with him again at two weeks and that's when I started sleep training because that's what I believe in and that's what worked for me and that's what worked for our kids. Yeah. Um, and I got so much blowback on this and I was like, if if there's anything that I'm proud of in this life, it's being a mom mm-hmm. and like knowing what works for our family and seeing all these people come at me saying that I'm letting my kid like suffer and be tortured. It really got to me because I thought, am I? No, I'm not. But is this what people really think of me? And that really bothered me. And I don't like how how we shape our, our self. It got to a point where I was shaping my self-worth on what other people thought of me mm. and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I did, I just didn't like feeling that. Which is a, kind of a shitty thing. Cause obviously you were talking about like blowback and like it almost paints a picture where the number of people was larger than it was because it yeah. feels that right. Well, it's like people are saying, well, there's like four people saying this, but it's, if it's four people who are telling you you're a shitty mom and you're abusing your child, like, that hurts you because yeah. inside, you know, that's not what you're doing. But as a new mom, you don't want to question. You don't want to feel like you have to question what you're doing. Right. Yeah. And I, I feel like, but I feel like we were lucky enough that it wasn't anything we relied on. Cause I think we've, we've known people that have kind of stuck with sharing that aspect of their lives past where they felt comfortable. Yeah. Um, Cause it was like the only way that they were making money at that point. Well, and it's a, for a lot of families, it's a great way to make money and still like spend all your time with, with your, your kids, kids yeah. and, and focus on home life, which I think is great. And if you have that like thick skin and go for it, like I think that's, and, and if your kids are comfortable with it, I think Trey did get to a point where he didn't want to participate. And I think I, I always like respected that. Sure. Um, but I remember one thing you said and you were like, if this ever starts to feel like a job, don't feel like you have to do it. Yeah. And that always stuck in my head. And then after I had Carter, I was so overwhelmed and so anxious and like, I just couldn't do it anymore. And it was really good money. And I know why people do it. Yeah. Children's content, like <laughs> it's the safest content. All advertisers want to do that. Like, like the HelloFresh videos. Thank you, HelloFresh, <laughs> um, for putting my kid through private school. But um, <laughs> but um, I forget where I was going with that. Main thing, you're amazing. Main thing. Oh, thank you. You're amazing. So last thing, or not last thing, second to last thing. 
st- around the family. Are you happy that you're no longer doing YouTube? Would you ever do it again? Not family content. Not family? Mm-mm. You don't want to open that, that, that well, door? Well, also because... You also do it on Instagram. Yeah, I do the family stuff on Instagram just, <laughs> just to stay relevant, I guess. Is that why? Why else... <laughs> Honestly, why else do people show their lives? I think to fill the empty hole in in my in myself. Yeah, and to stay relevant. You want to feel like mm. because I what is it? For the past decade, my self-worth as I was saying has been based on the reactions of strangers. And you are you be, become conditioned to feel that way. Mm. And as much as we try to pull away from it, it's still like this thing that has been ingrained at least in my head. Um, that's interesting because I mean I feel like that's but true I also to some appreciate I the conversation like I love the feedback is that secondary though I don't know I don't know yeah I feel like we end up doing Lindsay these Franco things. says that she only does this shit to stay relevant <laughs> Lynn speaks the truth about whatever other influencer wants to say but can't say because it'll make them look bad rude it's all, true, those pe- all, those pe- all those people come sharing on. stuff care do you think they real like come on no, I mean for me with Instagram, it's a uh, it's like a love hate relationship. But you have another like outlet. Like Instagram is sure. is secondary. But okay, the, why do you post saying. on Instagram? You post on Instagram so people can see your personality, it's so that when they go to your show, they know who is giving you the information. You're not posting on Instagram just for fun. If there was no, <laughs> if there was no back and forth with people, would you do it? No, well, this is the thing that I feel like such a fucking weirdo for saying when <laughs> when people are like, I shared this on like whatever platform where they have like, it's like private and they have 10 people. I'm like, but why? Why did you do it? Yeah. Um, just because I feel like I have like a weird relationship. I say stuff to connect to some people and to have some yeah. somewhat of a conversation. Part of it is probably baked into maybe the relevancy. Part of it, I think, is just habit. I think it's just like yeah, but where did the habit come from? From initially wanting to, to stay let's see, relevant. no, not to stay relevant, to feel good about myself. Yeah, okay, I yeah. Mean, and some people can get that out of yeah. feeling relevant. It probably wouldn't feel good if people start talking about you as someone that used to do stuff, right? Well, let's talk about this. You, well, I don't but know. But you, you know want to talk me, about this. like. Well, but I was going to say, you know me. Like I'm, I'm at a point in my career where I'm completely fine if no one knew me and I stopped. Like, I disagree. You don't think that? No, absolutely I not. Your ego that. wouldn't survive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would find other things. And you've said this too. I, well, I already know what I would do if I quit. I would immediately jump into uh, like marketing and PR and advising. Yeah, but I don't think you would be able to not have a public persona. And mm. not that that's bad. I don't know, man. I... I Maybe, Although maybe, you maybe get it's, maybe like, it's because, so hit so much, it's yeah, like you it's, need a break. Yeah, maybe it's because I've had the, the success of the shows and I've gone through the ups and downs, and unfortunately, I don't feel the ups anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. even if I have a video that does well, hit, you're still like it could do better. Yeah, well, I'm of the mindset of like oh, I didn't fail, but you know, when we did that kind of whatever video with Trey, I got so much joy filming it. I got so yeah. much joy seeing that it put a smile on other people's faces. And then I, and then it made me think of the news where, yes, I, I am uh, supplying a service of a safe place and sometimes entertaining place to consume news. But in general, my day is just telling you the bad stuff that happened <laughs> in the world. And I feel like I've just gotten really exhausted mm-hmm. with ruining people's days <laughs> like, well, but you also get that blowback that it's like why am i doing this well mm, some of the, that's the thing though is the the blowback doesn't make sense if if i didn't believe in my coverage mm-hmm. then you wouldn't. i would be i would feel more vulnerable yeah right but you know with the the people that work on the show and support the show. I feel very, very confident. Obviously, like you have people that are new that you're trying to cycle in and you're weed out uh, bad. And so there, there, there are areas of vulnerability uh, where that could be a concern. But I just, I think that's where I got a little bit of a change up. So maybe, maybe it's not that I would step away completely. It's just a matter of, and it's not to stay relevant. It's just to do something, to have my day make someone happier Mm. but that's the problem too is i feel like even saying that i'm like i know that i've gotten emails where it's like people have said the pds got them through this yeah but then i also don't know how much i should lean into that because people (laughs) people that make the most garbage fucking content in the world get some of those same email addresses from other people but i don't know i'm a little i'm a little lost on it this came 
done a therapy session right it here did. for well, you. Every single, so we've been screen testing these things and knowing, always, that, <laughs> knowing that a lot of it won't see the light of day, yeah. a lot of it just becomes like, hey, let me just empty my dark soul into this fucking uh, camera. I think that's good though, because people see a different side of you. But which I think, I think plays into Instagram where people see a different side of you. But I also think like even as you grow, so I think like the personality stuff, there's a lot of stuff that I want to say that I can't say because it impacts others, right? Part of also me not going after people's throats, it's part because I'm just such a swell guy and also because uh, I don't want to get, <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. I just realized uh, there's three cameras on me. They're going to get that eye roll somewhere. Yeah, yeah big, <laughs> hard. Um, but like, it, it, at some point, right, Trey's going to be old enough where a kid's going to be like, hey, your dad and fucking blah, blah, blah are in a fight. Your dad's a douchebag. Like, yeah. I, I'm like, I don't want to. Well, it's kind of happening at camp right now. Oh, well, not well, that not the, part. Not the negative part. But there's this count. Well, We'll call her a counselor. But she was like, I told Trey that I love your dad's show and I watch it every day. And she's very nice. Like, I'm not yeah, saying anything great, bad about her. But it was just like, oh, this is coming to be a thing now. Sure. With the uh, like the the connection. But yeah. in that way, it was a, a positive. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. Because I'm like, we got all these people watching out for our kids. But it's like, but it's also like, OK, well, if I say anything, there might. I mean, you found out that one of your <laughs> one of Trey's teachers. Oh, my God. Follows you on Instagram. Aww. And and so it's like and. Like anything that I do has this other different impact. I can't say things that, you know, it might shake shit up at work, but it's something yeah. I'm feeling. And so I feel like I feel like that's why I'm constantly looking for these other different things. And I think that even this, even if it got like a fifth of the audience that the PDS has, it's great because it's this different outlet for me where I get to just shoot off my mouth it'll probably get me in way more trouble than the pds ever has mm. but i uh i disagree because you're not talking about political stuff on this no i know but not yet not yet not yet but maybe when we get closer to the election well what i think i don't know why i got closer again <laughs> i think it'd be really cool for you to have journalists on and interview them like mainstream journalists mm. have them on and interview them so people can see like a real human side to them mm. as opposed to just like talking heads um because one of the biggest problems I think on news is that they have these talking heads on. You don't know anything about them. You don't know where they're coming sure. from. So you have no context to judge what they're saying by. Well, and you also, I know that it was a big point of conversation with you that journalists need to respond more. In terms of what? In, in the terms of usually, like in the past, you'd have a journalist that would maybe just put out a piece. Right. And it would exist. And then people would react to it. Mm -hmm. And commentators uh, like myself, but maybe one far one way far the other uh would break the piece down or expose its faults mm -hmm. and uh a lot of the times or sometimes it doesn't involve facts or it's yeah. just straight up lies uh and ah, if see? the journalist Call a lie, lie. <laughs> and if the journalist doesn't respond so it's like yeah. it's it's just seen by a, a chunk of people as okay, well, yeah, that, that piece was wrong and that right. person exposed it's it. Because someone than, exposed it and then they didn't like fight back. So there's like, right? Yeah. So Where there's that there line. No rebuttal. It's, yeah. So it's like, how do you have a rebuttal without going into a back, a constant back and forth? Kind of like what happened to you recently. Well, I mean, that guy responded to me, but it was mainly like, it was like, kind so you of. you say what we're talking about with the New York Times? The New York Times. Labeled which, Phil as an. Well, <laughs> They Ish. made it. They made it very easy, and I say this just from a because obviously we were talking about intent matters and yeah. Like, but also like, so they set up this headline. I talked about it on the PDS. Yeah, that made it very easy for you to potentially associate me with uh, with the alt right and extremism and extremism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, yeah, based off of the several different fucking headlines that they they used in several uh, captions, uh, yeah. captions as well. Um, or, so, yeah, but it yeah. was like, yeah, the first time it was like the it was a it was mainly like my <laughs> about my involvement. My main issue was with the graphic department, which was just. Just like, why was I included first in an animated uh, image that slowly weeded out so uh, it, randomly? So it, it was a grid of a bunch of different talking heads on the internet. Yeah. That and this guy s apparently watched that, that contributed was, to his differing viewpoints. Yeah, of him saying that he like went into extremism and then he pulled back because of other content. Right. But um, then Phil was included with a bunch of people whose content is drastically different than his. Yeah. 
but he was labeled as something that he is not. Well, that's the problem is when you say that I was labeled it, it was very easy to associate and connect me while they did not technically. And that's I right. Think, well, the, and, and that's I think that's the problem. The problem. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and so and so I thought it got handled and then they put put my picture uh, along with several others in the grid on the front page of the physical New York times yeah. Sunday edition. Well, this is like one of the problems in that people will look at this information and again, put a narrative on it that they want to be true. Sure. So many and people so you use that way so more than careful. me. Careful. Yeah. And I don't, and I think a lot of traditional news outlets are taking advantage of the sensationalism of headlines and captions and stuff like that. And I almost feel like with that article, I almost feel like you were baited a little bit. You and a few others were a little bit baited. Yeah, very like likely. on purpose. So, and I always get really concerned when we they start talking about They need those clicks intent. and they need... No, and I know, and I think that was But we thing. don't know. But no, but I mean, so one, there's enough air for deniability. Yeah. Um, but, and you too, you know that I don't, like, I used to be a lot more toothy and like the the way that i i address things but i don't want to be part of the all mainstream media is fake you need to just watch me because i'm yeah. the only place no and we can't demonize mainstream media because we need them right well, but we need to to I, I call think, out certain biases we need to call out where things are being skewed sure but at the same time recognize that mainstream media has a lot more resources than us mm-hmm. a lot more er, than us than you no, know, but I mean, no, but I mean, we're a lot more manpower. And so when you call all of that into question, you demonize all mainstream media. It's not helpful. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Like that broad <sighs> statement. On a tangent. But that <laughs> goes Sorry. into it perfectly. I'm, real, I'm amped up now. The thing that you want to talk about. Here's the thing. So when people criticize you, it gets me riled up back to like the first. No, second, I was going to say question. media literacy. Media right? literacy. Because that, that's ultimately what it kind of boils down to. Yeah. Can you explain what you're you're working on now? So for the past year, well, here's where it started. So media literacy, in my opinion, is is having an awareness of the biases and, you know, the purpose of um, kind of what mainstream media is trying to make you not make you think, but how things are shaped. Sure. Um, and you need to have an awareness that there is not an unbiased source. There's no such thing as an unbiased sure. source. So what you need to do when you're when you're reading news stories and you're watching people like you, you need to to realize that there's no perfect, you know, news aggregator. And you need to know this is where this person's coming from, which also goes into what I think would be great as you interviewing journalists so you can see where people are coming from. But it's also about realizing that you need to check your facts. It's mm. very easy for a website to appear credible it's very easy to have these clickbait headlines that shape your reality. Um, Cause a lot of people, you know, they're on Twitter, they're on Snapchat, they're on Facebook and they'll read a headline and then you actually, and the headline evokes an emotional response mm-hmm. in you. And then you click on the headline, which what, like a lot of people don't do. And you read the article and you realize, Oh, this article does not match the headline. Right. So a lot of traditional news sources are using clickbait to get clicks, to get money and whatever. And it's just what it comes down to for me is having an awareness of the media landscape. And how are you trying to, to help this kind of <laughs> oh landscape and potentially future generations? Cause honestly, I mean, when we talk about the news, when when I'm like, sometimes I feel like I'm just shouting in a room by myself. I feel like a lot of it boils down to the younger kids, yeah, which I mean, it a, does a lot because of, a lot yeah. of us are already set in our ways, mm-hmm. and and when you're confronted with information that doesn't confirm your already held beliefs, the first thing a lot of us want to do is get defensive, and we'll double down on it, and we sure. won't even quite it, it, think about it this way. Like I'll be scrolling on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and I'll see a headline that confirms exactly what I think. Am I going to go check that information or I, am I just going to retweet it because I'm like, yeah, I'm right. This is how I feel. You know, that's right. your intrinsic quality of like, I'm right. This is right. Somebody else feels this way. But just because it confirms your already held beliefs and your biases doesn't mean it's true. Right. So what I want to do and what I'm trying to do and have... <laughs> <sighs> I'm frustrated because there's a lot of other companies doing this with a lot of funding and 
But that's the thing is like a lot of the funding comes from corporations that are deemed part of the problem. So here's the thing. We, me and my friend Bailey for about a year have been working on this curriculum and this program to go to schools and have free resources to empower and educate and teach students to think critically and, and teachers to teach students and teachers how to think critically and have awareness about the information that they uh, encounter on a daily basis. But it's really hard. And um, something so there, there's a lot of other companies out there that are sort of trying to do this, but I think that one of the points that are missing in in the already existing companies is that they're not um, shining light on how algorithms work. And so when you go to Google and you search for something, the search results you get are not a real representation of reality. The search results you get are based off of other articles that you've clicked on. Mm -hmm. So really you're in your own filter bubble, your own echo chamber, which is Google. And I'm not trying to demonize Google. I'm just saying like you have to have an awareness. I think it's fine to, to, to critic, criticize an issue that I think they're they're heavily aware of, and there's just mainly a debate of how much they're actually trying to handle the problem versus versus like their profits. Skirt it a their profits bit. are their profits, right? Yeah, Attention so, economy, one hundred percent. Well, yeah. So it's just about having an awareness that when when you go to Google and you search something, the results that come up are based off of your previous clicks. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get a real result. Say you're very very liberal when you go type in gun control on Google. If you've searched other like you've clicked on other very like left leaning articles, you're going to get more left leaning articles that could be like true information, whatever. Um, But then that, that skews how we view the world around us. Even when we go on Twitter and we have our own filter bubbles, I have this too. You have this, everybody has this because we choose to follow and retweet and click on things that, that make our brain happy and things that we like agree with. So we create these filter bubbles and these echo chambers that really skew how we see the world. And so I just want to raise an awareness to let people know, like, check your facts. Just because someone has a check mark or is verified doesn't mean that they're saying true things. Mm. And I want people to know that, like, a lot of people in power are not being held accountable. Mm. And a lot of people are lying and they're not being held accountable. So they're just going to keep lying and people are going to take it as fact. And that's been that it's not like a new problem sure. but it has been throttled by the by the internet but your so your goal in large though is though to equip not only kind of get people into the right questioning headspace but show them the skills and the tools on how to to go the step further to make sure that something is fake news or is is accurate well yeah and i also think i almost think fake news is like a trigger word now. It like makes people <laughs> mad. There's this whole like tribalism aspect of the internet. Sure. And even like, so I'll go online and I'll see how people are fighting with each other. And then that makes me not want to talk in real life to people about these issues because I assume mm-hmm. that they're going to get mad. Right. When really civil discussion is possible in in person, um, much more so than online because you're not hiding behind a keyboard. Sure. And I think it's shaping our real- realities in a way that is not helpful. So I just want to empower students and like give them the tools to, to fact check and awareness is like the biggest thing. Like just be aware. You can have your favorite news sources, but be aware that everything has a bias in some way. Sure. And that's not bad. You cannot escape bias. Some people are like, this is an unbiased news source. I'm like, that's not a thing. <laughs> you can't be an unbiased news source. You can try to be, yeah, but you're you're not right. You you are a human being that has the feelings that you have. You're not, yeah. And, it's and, just how you present it. And false information but, spreads faster than true information. Sure. One like what was it? See, here's the thing. I don't want to throw out a a, a number that isn't true, um, but it spreads a just lot faster. No. no, 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 no. So I was question, gonna say sixty percent faster, but I'm not quite sure. So a question around this because this was actually how I was gonna introduce it because this came from a viewer was what makes you qualified to write a curriculum on media literacy? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Here's the thing: there's a lot of other organizations coming at it from a journalism perspective, from an educator's perspective. I'm coming at it from a perspective of I realize that there's this problem and I'm trying to figure it out just like you guys are. I didn't go to school for this, but I've 
been trying to educate myself. I've been going to conventions. I've been reading books. I've been talking to professors. I've been talking to people who have these organizations already. And I'm trying to figure out how we can do this, make the content digestible, make it easy to read, make it fun and how to like affect change. I'm not an expert, but I'm trying to learn. And I hope that that will come across as like, we're in this together. Yeah. Well, I think and, when and I, as a parent too, when I read that question, I was like, well, what makes me qualified <laughs> to, to deliver the news to how many, however many people that I deliver to it on a, a daily basis. And you're not, you didn't yeah, go to journalism did, school, I, but I, you're trying your best. Yeah. You I was know? like, I, I'm a, a college dropout who thought I was going to be a doctor and yeah. realized I was not, it was not in the cards for me. But with all this access to information, I feel like so many people, so, you know, there's this free access to Endless amounts of information. Sure. And that creates a false sense of knowledge with people. And they think they know what's right. And it's about admitting, like, I might not know what's right. Mm -hmm. And being willing to change your mind when faced with evidence to the contrary. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not bad to change your mind. It shows growth. It shows being willing to consider evidence. But there's, you know, there's also been an erosion of evidentiary standards. And it's like... Who needs evidence when I also think that people that, don't use it anymore? <laughs> I also think when like when you say like expert, right? The the issue that we're having, obviously news that is not accurate is not a new problem, but the current environment is very new and everyone's kind of going by uh just like just in real time figuring everything out. I think people are just comfortable with the the appearance of expertise. Like they'll find their people who they trust for their sure. news. And as long as they appear to be credible, they'll take what they say as fact. Sure. And so you see on the news, the news will have people like they're talking heads for their, not the people who are employed by the news networks, mm-hmm. but people that they have on as commentators. They'll have them on and they'll be like, well, this person works for this think tank. Well, do you know what's going on at think tanks? Like they're all funded by people who have an agenda. So just because somebody works at a think tank or was a professor for one semester at this specific place does not mean that they are qualified to speak on this subject. Right. Kind of like what I'm doing, but I'm trying and I, I feel like I'm being transparent about the fact like I didn't go to school for this. I'm trying really hard and I'm learning as I go. Well, I think the fact that it's also presenting myself as an expert. Yeah. And I also think that there is in in an environment where you're saying that there's a problem with the system, right. And the corporations involved in that system for the solution to come from those corporations. I think there is a reason and an understanding behind people's reasoning of why they would be concerned or uh, think that something couldn't be trusted, even if everything is above the board. And I think that there's something to be said about in general, in this entire space, outsiders coming in without corporate funding, um, obviously dollars will have to come in and people can attach whatever feelings they want to that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately I think coming in fresh like that, I think it's good. I think it's, well, yes, (laughs) I'm just supporting you. you. Well, I feel very fortunate to be in a position where I can self fund. I can self fund to a point. You know what I mean? Like it's me and my friend Bailey and we've been working very hard on this and we have an office and that's about, and the money that I put into it will pay for our rent. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like I, we will eventually need help. Now will I accept help and funding from corporations that want to have an impact on the content that we're putting out? Absolutely not. And which I know that was like, I know you've looked at several companies and you're like, oh, the content has been shaped by that. However, the people at those companies mean well. Yes. They and they are aware that there's a problem. So what Bailey and I are trying to figure out how to do is fund what we need to do without taking corporate money. So you're going to take. So what I told her, what I told her is like, well, you know, it's like Energizer, like the battery company, they have nothing to say about media literacy. Like we'll take their money, but it's like, you know, we're not going to take a search engines money, (laughs) you know? Yeah. So you, you, you take over my Friday show. You just expose the fake news and how it could have been avoided. Fake news is an intent to deceive. It is not. (laughs) Yeah. No, not, it is not something that people in power do not like. I'm just, the more so, what I've learned is the more you repeat a lie, the more people. So, like, what would you want me to call it? it? No, no, I'm just no. You can call it fake news. I'm just repeating what the definition is. So let's say news that is not accurate. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like, ugh, 
It's a whole minefield of stuff. And it's very like politically charged. Like I knew that wearing this shirt coming in here would turn people off to my message before even talking. You think people put you in a box because of it? Yeah. I mean, because I've seen a lot of just kind of plays on it, like make Oakland cool again or like not. Oakland, that would have but... been less politically charged than this. No, I think make America think again. It should be universal. Right. Well, and then so I asked my friend, I said, should I wear this on the podcast? And she said, well, maybe not. But also the people who are going to be offended and turned off by that aren't going to be open to your message anyways. Yeah, because I was going to say, I mean, I know like when obviously no one <laughs> people aren't on your personal Facebook to know what you're doing. But it's like I know that you shoot down your your right wing relatives as much as you do your left wing. That's relatives. true. I have one left wing relative who just posts all this stuff. And I'm just like, what are you doing? It's it's not helping. It's yeah. not helping. You're just becoming the, the, the other example for the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Are you but okay? You having a pa- are you freaking out? <laughs> I'm just, I'm very passionate about this. And I feel like I'm at a point where like, I just don't know like I just don't what know to what. do. Like I just need to hop into it and just go. Well, I mean, based off of what you showed me, I feel really confident. Plus, also the fact that, like, when you hit me up in the middle of the day and you see a version of a story or a fault in a story that I was otherwise covering that I didn't catch, that maybe my team was catching and they were updating something or maybe they missed it, like, I know that you're equipped for it. Yeah. And that's not me just saying it because I'm Thank your you. husband. Uh, but yeah, I don't I've know. I've been working I'm, really hard. No, but I'm excited Thank about you. it. I think, well, because I really do think that it's. It's the kids. I think Yeah. There, there there has to be an attachment to the person, right? And the and a thinking around it. Like I know there are people that that watch me because their opinion matches up all the time, but I know there's a decent number of people that that watch because they want to see a different point of view, right? So that there's open uh, openness and there there's trust there. So it's yeah. really just about building up that trust in younger kids. And I think it's probably also even us talking about it and understanding that it probably involves other people. Like, yeah. and what's really cool is based off of everything that's happened over the past 15 years, both in politics and society with technology. Um, I'm finding more and more younger people every day that are being outspoken. Yeah. Um, which is great because I think a lot of young people also are disengaging mm-hmm. because of how toxic oh, yeah. the landscape is. And we don't need young people to disengage. What we need to do is educate them and empower them and let them know like, okay, Okay, you're going to get some blowback on this. But like if you feel something, speak up because we need your voice. Another thing I think that isn't being like talked about is the why this is a problem, like why all this false information is a problem. And it's like, you know, (laughs) if you're given the wrong information, you're not going to vote. Not correctly, but you can't vote based off of wrong information. You can't affect change based off of the wrong information. So if you're fed the wrong information all, all day, you're going to not make the smartest decisions. So I'm just pissed about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we're going to end it. I'm just pissed about with it. With Lindsay just being pissed about Was it. Was that bad? Should I not have said that? No, you're great. Did I do a good job? You did a Did super I hold solid. a conversation? You held a conversation. It was really good. We got through the part where uh, you kind of roasted me that we bonded together yeah. and then we, we looked outwards. <laughs> well, thank you for being my, uh, my first guest. Uh, did I hold the conversation? Well, you did great. Wow. So you hating on me this morning really helped. See, I did it for you. Yeah. I did it for us. You were projecting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for watching. I love you faces. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so that my wife doesn't leave me. Also, pay like look out for what I'm doing in the future. Like, just follow me and stuff. Also, follow Lindsay on Instagram because I'm launching soon. But don't send creepy messages. Or do. Wow.